Western Pennsylvania, where she developed a strong interest in agricultural sciences. <laughs> this led her to employment through her high school years as an evening milker at a local dairy. It was there that she developed an interest in biting flies. In 1990, she received a BS in biology from Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania. She attended the University of Massachusetts to pursue her master's degree in entomology. During her second year of research on Cape Cod, she interned with renowned CDC WHO, or WHO entomologist Dr. Richard Haynes, who had been working as a project entomologist for Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project. Once she completed her degree in 1993, she was hired as a full-time project entomologist at the Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project, where she serves as staff entomologist and assistant superintendent. She has conducted and directed the Mosquito Arbovirus Surveillance Program for Barnstable County over the past 23 years. She's developed or improved new trapping methods for greenhead flies, designed a new trap to study mosquito populations that is currently being tested in several Atlantic states, and has worked on several international studies in Canada and Africa. She lives in Yarmouth, Mass. with her husband, two kids, and two dumb but lovable dogs. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing. My husband wrote that. <laughs> That's more than anybody ever needed to know about me, really. Really. But it's hard to write about yourself. Yeah. It is. <clears throat> so let's see. All right. So I am the entomologist and the assistant superintendent for the Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project. We were established back in 1930. We're a quasi-state organization. So all of our towns pay in to our funds. So all 15 towns in Barnesville County are members, so I work for you, not for the Commonwealth of Mass. <laughs> That's a big argument sometimes. Um, we're the first organized mosquito control project in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the reason why we were established wasn't for disease control. It was because the businesses got together with the Chamber of Commerce and they decided they wanted more people to stay here, spend their money, stop slapping things, so they got together and formed the Mosquito Control Project. Um, how do we do mosquito control on Cape Cod? We use integrated pest management. So it's using, very basically, a variety of different ways to control your pests. So this time of year, my crews are out April through September, checking any standing water, taking dips, looking for mosquito larvae. If they meet the threshold, enough mosquitoes that we think they're gonna cause a problem, transmit disease, then we're applying products that kill mosquitoes in their developmental stages. So we apply, for the most part, a bacteria to the water. It's very specific to mosquitoes. The mosquitoes feed on that bacteria. Some of you may have heard of it who have garden. BTI is what we use. We use BTK for different, pro for different pests. So the mosquitoes are filter feeders in the larval stage, and they're feeding on whatever's in the water. They feed on that bacteria, and they die. Very targeted approach to mosquito <coughs> control. The only downside, maybe, for my employees is that it's only in the water for 48 hours. 48 hours later, it's gone. So good in that it's not persisting to create other difficulties. Bad because every couple weeks you're going back to the same places. Although this time of year, this year, everything's pretty much dry. Um, so that's what we're doing April through September. The rest of the year, and a lot of people say to me, you know, do you work year round? I have 25 employees, we all work year round. And the reason why we don't need to necessarily drive trucks around, and I'm sure you see it on the news, off Cape they're driving trucks around spraying, a lot of it's our habitat. We're able to control mosquitoes by controlling that standing water and letting fish have access to where the mosquitoes are developing. That way we can do what we do and not have to worry about spraying from trucks. Um, so we're doing, in the winter time, we're doing water management opening up, just like you saw, opening up creeks, digging things out, opening up pipes, just making sure that the water keeps moving. Um, but that's a huge part of it. And then year round we do education. A lot of mosquito issues come from people's own backyards. We get about 200 calls in the summer, and of those people, for each phone call my office gets, we send our crew out to see where those mosquitoes are coming from. Oftentimes, what they find is those mosquitoes are coming from a tar that's over something in their backyard. Oh, a classic is a boat that has a tarp over it, so not only is the tar pulling water, but also the boat is holding water. Thousands of mosquitoes coming out. So year-round, we're doing education. Remind people, just go around your yard, empty out the water. 
You won't have a mosquito problem. All right, I'm an entomologist. I can't help it. I gotta show at least one picture of the life cycle of a mosquito. Um, and part of any good integrated pest management plan is knowing your pest, knowing where in the cycle they're, they're most vulnerable. So like I said, on Cape Cod, we're controlling mosquitoes when they're in the water, not when they're flying in the air. Once they're flying, they're a problem. They're biting people. Um, so anyway, that's the mosquito life cycle. They lay their eggs on standing water or around the edges of standing water. The larvae hatch from those eggs. Those larvae are underwater. You can see, which one is the pointer? When oh, you, this. you push on here for the next. Top or? Oh, there. All right, so you can see with the larvae, these are air tubes. They live underwater, but they breathe air. They have to come up to the top. They use those snorkels to breathe air. The next stage where they're undergoing metamorphosis, you can start to see wings developing. The pupal stage, also in water. Also need to come to the top so they can get air. And then the flying adult mosquito. I'm sure nobody here who lives on Cape Cod ever sees those. Um, so when people call our office, they're sure that the mosquitoes are coming from the swamp behind their house. Um, I know people who study swamps that spend a lot of time in swamps. Um, and they can tell you a lot of times the mosquitoes aren't coming from that swamp. We use GIS in our trucks, online, real time. Our trucks, our employees know where those swamps are. They're going around to those swamps checking for mosquitoes. So most likely when somebody calls, it's not because of the swamp. It's because of something going on in their yard or their neighbor's yard. So in any integrated pest management program, what you want to do is see where your pest is. And then you want to see if your program's effective, right? You're putting all this time and energy into doing something. Um, so we do surveillance. We do efficacy surveillance. And we have all sorts of traps around the oyster pond area. Um, oh yeah, you can see my red dots. So those dots, so that map is showing you all the sites that we trap at on Cape Cod. You can see a couple of those red dots right in your area. Um, we're using these light traps for deciding what mosquitoes are out there biting people. In the top, that bucket up at the top, that's frozen dry ice. So frozen dry ice, a little redundant. So it's dry ice, and what happens is dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. As the carbon dioxide turns from the solid to the gas, it falls down over my trap. That's how mosquitoes find you. Every time you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide, that's how they key in on you. That's why in the dark, they can still find you. Um, so the mosquitoes come into that trap thinking something's breathing in there. And then below it is a little light, so they come in for the breath, they see the light, they go towards the light, and unfortunately there's a fan below it that sucks them into the net. So unfortunately for them, fortunately for me, I can take a look at what mosquitoes are out there bothering people. Is, is our program effective? Are there species of mosquitoes out there that might be transmitting disease? So I'm looking at all of those things. That's what those traps are for. We also have a couple of different traps that we're running for arbovirus surveillance. Arboviruses are viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And here in Massachusetts, our concern is Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. So that's what those traps are mostly attracting. So I, we put these out on a weekly basis in different places on Cape Cod. Again, some in Woods Hole. And what happens is this, for instance, is a gravid trap. What happens is the mosquitoes that are potentially carrying West Nile virus are the species of mosquitoes that lay their eggs in man-made containers. Um, there are about 25 different species on Cape Cod of mosquitoes, and some of them bite people, some of them don't, some of them can vector <coughs> disease, some of them don't. But these mosquitoes that lay their eggs in man-made containers are the potential vectors for West Nile virus. So what we do is we put out man-made containers, and we put really organic, smelly water in them. And female mosquitoes go in to lay their eggs in that water, and they get sucked up into that net. Again, there's a fan. If you can imagine, mosquitoes feed on blood because they need the protein in your blood to develop their eggs. So a mosquito that has developed eggs has already taken a blood meal. So that means that's the most likely time in their life cycle when they will be positive for a disease, when they've picked up a disease. So that's what we're targeting with those gravid traps. The other trap above it is a resting box. We put those around the cedar swamps. The mosquitoes that carry eastern equine encephalitis and cycle that disease are bird biting mosquitoes, and they're not very attracted to my light traps. So with these resting boxes, it's just what looks like a black box. We put it around the cedar swamp. 
The mosquitoes go up into the trees where the birds are roosting at night. They feed on those roosting birds. They come back down, and now they're looking for a place to digest the blood meal and develop their eggs. They go into boxes to stay out of the sun and the wind. It, it's really simple. <laughs> now I say I'm, I'm one of those lazy entomologists. I don't actually have to go out to find my insect I study. They all come to me. I can just sit back. So again, we're looking at transmission of two diseases here in Massachusetts, um, West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. Both of those diseases have the same disease cycle. Birds are the <coughs> reservoirs for the disease. A mosquito bites a bird that's infected with one of these diseases, and then that bird, that mosquito carries it to another bird and infects the next bird. The disease is amplified in the bird population for both of those, West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. And every so often, a mosquito that bites both birds and mammals, like us, carries the disease into the human population. Um, with West Nile virus, those mosquitoes, again, it's very specific which mosquitoes can carry which diseases. With West Nile virus, those mosquitoes that lay their eggs in man-made containers, they bite birds and people. Very easy for that disease to go from the bird population to the human population. In Massachusetts, the Department of Public Health will tell you that what they assume is that there is West Nile virus in every town in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at a low level. We're doing testing throughout the season. They called today to tell me that now I've had my second positive pool of mosquitoes submitted from Woods Hole. So if anybody wants to tell me about their neighbors who they think might have containers in their yard, I'd be happy to listen later. I won't give you away. But obviously somewhere mosquitoes are coming out. Um, my crews are out there treating the man-made containers that you can't control, like road drains. Those are man-made containers that mosquito populations are coming out of all the time. We take care of that. We do a lot of education, but still, there are mosquitoes out there, and in Woods Hole, <coughs> we've had our second positive. So, with Eastern Equine Encephalitis, it's a little different. The mosquitoes that are amplifying the disease are those bird-biting mosquitoes. So you need every once in a while for another mosquito, and they're not really sure which species it is, to pick it up from the bird and carry it to the human population. With West Nile virus, most people who are infected with it don't even have any symptoms, or may have a summer flu. Other people who get West Nile virus are affected with encephalitis, and some people have died from West Nile virus, but very low percentages. With Eastern Equine Encephalitis, it's good that it's so rare. The mortality rate is 40 to 50%. And most people who survive Eastern equine encephalitis have long-term symptoms that stay with them. So it, it, it's good it, it, that it doesn't end up in the human population very often. So we're constantly, historically, um, well, since 2004, West Nile virus, but historically we've been testing mosquitoes for those diseases. So what's the news? What's everybody talking about? Wendy told me I had to put it in the title. It's, it's Zika, and, and I can't even believe that it would get bigger over the summer till now when everybody's talking about it. Zika is different than West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis in that, in a lot of ways, but in that primarily the life cycle of the disease is very different. Zika is a disease where an infected person is the reservoir for the disease. A mosquito bites an infected person and then carries it to the next person. There's no bird involved. It's all people, mosquito people, in the mosquito transmission of the disease. Um, there are only two mosquitoes in North America that they know are capable of transmitting this disease. Of course, it's new to this area, so they're constantly studying it. Zika is a forest in Uganda. That's where the name comes from. Zika has been around for a long time in Uganda. Um, it's just new to the Americas. So here in North America, the only two mosquitoes that they know possibly can carry it are Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, nowhere even near Massachusetts, and the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. That mosquito would be possibly the mosquito that could potentially carry it in this area, the Asian tiger mosquito. These mosquitoes also carry other very serious diseases. They, they go through the same life cycle, chikungunya, dengue, Dengue is worldwide the most, um, is affecting the most people in the world today. Millions, hundreds of millions of people have been affected with dengue. Dengue is commonly known as bone break fever, and the people I know who have had it say it, it's terrible, lasts for a long time. 
Zika is a little different. A lot of people who get it, it's like West Nile virus, no symptoms at all. Um, so obviously the concern, I'm sure everybody's seen the news, is if you're pregnant and you should get Zika, it, would, it can affect your children. So this is what started coming out in the news. They're, they keep posting up vector maps. They keep getting bigger. That was the first vector maps way back when they started talking about Zika. Looking at the distribution in the United States of that 80s Egypti, I have a friend who's an epidemiologist in Georgia who works with the CDC. She has one place in Georgia where they routinely collect 80s Egypti. That's it. That's as far north as I talk to anybody having a sustained population of that mosquito. The other mosquito, Aedes albopictus, that Asian tiger mosquito is definitely further distributed. That comes all the way up the East Coast. New Jersey has terrible problems with that mosquito. It's an aggressive, day-biting mosquito. She likes to lay her eggs in every little container, like a water bottle. At every, and you can imagine in a more populated environment, not like necessarily here, but in a very populated environment, like some city in New Jersey, how difficult it would be to control every little water bottle that somebody left outside. It, it's impossible. Um, these are the mosquitoes that are potentially able to carry Zika. Um, CDC just published their latest report on the distribution of the Asian tiger mosquito. That would be, again, the mosquito that would be in this area that could capa be capable of transmitting the disease. Um, so this is more realistic information. This is based on trapping and surveillance done by mosquito professionals. Uh, you can see how close it is. In New Bedford, they've had a number of years of sustained um, Asian tiger mosquito populations. Where they found it is in, around a tire recycling facility. Mosquitoes lay their eggs in standing water. Tires, oh my gosh, if anybody's ever tried to get water out of the tire that's sitting in the backyard, it's impossible. It's physics. The water doesn't come out. The tire's made so that you can't poke a hole in it. Tires travel all the time to these recycling facilities. And in New Bedford, that is most likely what was happening. They were being, they, they may not have had a sustained population that was overwintering. That, that mosquito just kept coming in with the tires every year. Um, so we've been doing over the past number of years, four or five years, we've been doing surveillance here in Barnesville County for the Asian tiger mosquito. More because I'm concerned about chikungunya, dengue, and it's again a very aggressive daytime biting mosquito. We have salt marsh mosquitoes here that will bite you during the day, and that's a horrible thing. And when they, when there's an area where we have um, a bunch of them emerge, we get so many calls. They're biting you all day. You're standing out in the sun. Not just one, but many of them are biting you. Um, so we have concerns even then. So we have continued our surveillance for Asian tiger mosquito. I have never caught one in Barnstable County. Um, but what you see now off Cape, and again, just talking to the Department of Public Health today, is that that Asian tiger mosquito population in Massachusetts <coughs> is expanding. So whether it's being seeded into different places or whether they're capable of overwintering, that's where the studies are right now, whether that's going to continue. Right now, I haven't found the vector on Cape Cod, but we keep looking because I figure it could be any day. New Bedford, that's not very far. And they found it even closer now, so it is not far away. Um, those mosquitoes lay their eggs in man-made containers. So my message is the same as, it, as it's always been. Um, those mosquitoes rely on people not to check around their yard and empty out containers. So the best thing everybody can do to help me and to help themselves is, again, whether it's West Nile virus, whether it's Zika, whatever you're worried about, it's never good to be bitten by mosquitoes after it rains or after your sprinklers have run. Walk around the yard and make sure that there's no standing water. I do have fact sheets. Most of the boards of health and the county health department have posted this. What I look for is people to let me know if they think they're, they're having a problem with Asian tiger mosquitoes. There are three things you can ask yourself. Because here, inland, it's not a difficult thing. If there's a mosquito biting you during the day, it's most likely an Asian tiger mosquito. Here on the coast, you've got salt marsh mosquitoes that are biting you during the day as well. Asian tiger mosquitoes are easy to identify in that, first of all, they bite during the day. Second of all, they're really, really small. I know the news keeps putting up pictures of these <laughs> giant Asian tiger mosquitoes. You're like, oh, I would recognize that with the big white line and with all that. You know, they look almost like the size of, 
you would not necessarily recognize them as mosquitoes. That's how small they are. They're like half the size of the mosquitoes you usually see, if not less. So teeny tiny, very dark mosquitoes with white marks that bite your legs. And so I have had people who around the Cape who've called me saying that they have this and we've taken traps out that are specifically designed to capture Asian tiger mosquitoes and today, again, no Asian tiger mosquitoes. But we keep looking, so if anybody would ever feel that this is what they're experiencing, <coughs> we ask that they call the Cape Town Mosquito Control Project. In fact, if you're experiencing any mosquito control problem, a mosquito population problem at all, you can call the Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project. That's what we do. Um, if you're interested in disease risk in your area, the State Department of Public Health on a weekly basis publishes on their website information on the risk in each town in Massachusetts. They publish maps on West Nile virus and Eastern Equine encephalitis. You can see if there were any positive pools in your town, if the risk level has changed in your town, anything like that. That's all available. They have a lot of fact sheets available online. They have fact sheets on repellents, all sorts of things. Um, just to give you an idea, obviously, I also get a lot of questions about mosquitoes and climate change. You know, is, is there some change in the mosquito populations due to climate change? I, I don't know. I've been looking at mosquitoes over a very short period of time, 20 years. Have I seen changes? Sure, I've seen changes. Who knows why I've seen changes? Um, but obviously, weather is going to affect mosquito populations, and weather is going to affect how much disease is around. And this is just to give you an idea, 2013, we had record amounts of rain in June. It rained, maybe over six inches, maybe more. Um, and you can see how many positives that summer we had for West Nile virus around the Cape. 14 and 15 and 16, pretty dry. So for 14, we only had that one positive in what's whole. And then in 15, we had the one positive in Woods Hole and the one positive in Barnes School. And this year, the only mosquitoes that have tested positive, again, are those two in Woods Hole. So again, if anybody wants to tell me about their neighbors, I'd be happy to listen. Um, so my advice, um, because I guess that comes down the bottom line, is first of all, I said it a lot of times now, um, but go around your yard and empty out the standing water. Mosquitoes that lay their eggs in man-made containers don't fly far. If you're experiencing mosquitoes at dusk, those are freshwater mosquitoes, they're coming from your yard, your neighbor's yard, they're coming from really close. Sometimes in my house it's the gutters, but you know, it's, it's close, standing water. Um, and when you choose a repellent, choose to use a repellent that has an EPA registration number on it. There are a lot of different repellents out there that are labeled for repelling mosquitoes. If it doesn't have an EPA registration number on it, that means it hasn't been tested to be safe to use on your skin, and the county extension service has gotten a lot of calls to their tick office from people buying natural repellents around the farmer's markets and such that have been used on skin that have irritants to skin in them. They aren't, they are governed by no one without that EPA registration number. The other part of obviously that EPA registration number is that it's been tested to be effective for use if you follow the label instructions. That's it. There are lots of different active ingredients that work in repellents. It's not just DEET, it's oil, lemon, eucalyptus, it's keratin. You gotta find what works for you and what you're confident with, but make sure that it's been tested. Um, and if you're having a mosquito problem, you can always call my office. I'm happy to send out a crew and see what's going on. Does anybody have any questions? Sure. I have a question about your breeding environment. Let's do it that way. I have a question about their breeding environments. I think you implied that the real reason they don't like man-made containers is really the fresh water. The water, I mean, they can't know that it's man-made. Oh, they actually <laughs> do target it on man-made containers. I, I don't know why. I don't know what it is about the water quality or whatever it is in there, but mosquitoes that lay their eggs in man-made containers definitely have evolved a way to recognize that. So they lay their eggs in catch <coughs> basins, planters. I, I, I don't know what's different about it. 
but that is that is true. Mosquitoes the, mosquitoes are very specific about the type of habitat where they lay their eggs. I have 25 species common on Cape Cod. Two species are salt marsh, only salt marsh. One is brackish, only brackish. I have species that only lay their eggs in cedar swamps and develop there. They tend to also like acidic water from old cranberry logs. I have vernal pool mosquitoes. I have tire That's mosquitoes. The other thing I want to know about yeah. are vernal pools because they don't have fish to eat the My, spring tails. They, it depends on how quickly they dry up in the season. For a lot of mosquito issues, vernal pools aren't a big issue because they dry up quickly. Uh, it just depends on the season, but we'd be happy to check them. The products that we use, again, are very targeted so that if we would, if there was a large population of mosquitoes developing there that you wanted to control, we could control those mosquitoes without affecting anything else in the system. Because as a town, we're adding a bunch of vernal pools at the, you know, Fry Vogel area. So we do, we do continue to check around, and then if we get calls, we check in the water to see if there are mosquitoes developing there. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how long the water is around for. This time of year, seven days is all it takes a, is from a mosquito to go from egg to adult. But in the spring, it's weeks and weeks. They're developing very slowly because the water is so cold. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. How do, how do mosquitoes survive uh, northern <coughs> climates in the winter? Do they hibernate? Do, does the adult hibernate? Or does the egg uh, survive? Okay, so that's, that's going to be like everything I answer. It depends on the species. Most species overwinter in the egg stage. We have one species that lives on the roots of cattails. It actually hooks its air tube into the roots of cattails and breathes through the cattail. Crazy how things evolve. Um, so that species overwinters as larva because they're in the ground pretty, pretty well protected. We have another species, the species that carry West Nile virus overwinters adults. They go into culverts, they go into, um, into in the woods, they would go just somewhere protected. They go into insect hibernation, which is diapods. So the adults will do that. We also have the species that can transmit, that amplifies eastern encephalitis, that bird biting mosquito, overwinters as a larva. And with insects, a lot of insects that live in water in their larval stages in a climate like ours um, have in them, it's like an antifreeze. So it's a chemical that prevents the cells from actually freezing. So I can say when my kids were little, I used to collect them, we'd put them in the freezer, <coughs> they'd freeze up in an ice cube, and then we'd just let the ice cube melt, and then they come back, come back to life. <laughs> Super fun. But anyway, yeah, it just depends on the mosquito. They've all developed different ways. Things like that yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti, hasn't developed away, so it's not here. They're all attracted to CO2? Um, all species. Well, it's on the video. Oh. I asked, are all the mosquitoes attracted to carbon dioxide? To some degree or another, yes. Um, we have species of mosquitoes that are more attracted to other chemicals, like those bird bite mosquitoes. For whatever reason, they're not as interested in my CO2 traps. I'll get them in there, and they're somewhat attracted. We also have on the Cape um, a species of mosquito that keys in on reptiles and amphibians. Again, that mosquito is not interested in my CO2 tank, my t CO2 traps. I don't know why. They're looking for other chemicals, must be. You'll see them sometimes, the turtles will be walking around on mosquitoes all following them. That's not a mosquito that would bite us, it just bites turtles, so reptiles, some, amphibians. A few people older than I am have assured me that mosquitoes don't like vitamin B12. Oh. Is that true? So, so the thing is, everybody's body chemistry is a little different. I, I find that things like that work for some people and not other people. Just the way some repellents work better for some people and other people. It's just your body and how your body works. It's, it, it's not like I have some people who say when they eat garlic, mosquitoes don't bite them. It's, it's really you and it's very specific to your body, not necessarily for everybody. So, Gabrielle, I'm just no, I'm thinking about my own yard. Yeah. Uh, I've got a bird bath because the birds love to come, you know, yep. uh, take a, a little bath in it. I, and I fill it up with a garden hose every two or three days when the water gets funky. Am I growing mosquitoes in that? Oh, or? you definitely need to dump it out. 
Yeah. Not just fill it up, but yeah, if you oh, dump yeah. it out, you're fine. Okay. It takes them probably seven days, maybe okay. six on a warm. So as long the birds make a mess before that. Okay, and then yeah. uh, how yeah. about uh, citronella and tiki torches and things you put out at night when you're barbecuing or those? Yeah, but if not? you think about it, I guess, so I also think when you talk about those things, I also talk, think about those clip-ons that they sell that have the repellent in them. They're supposed to, I don't know if you've seen the ads, they make a bubble around you and the mosquitoes can't get through that bubble. Um, the thing is when you're outside, there's always wind blowing. There's no way to create enough of a barrier with any of those smells to keep the mosquitoes away. They still smell you. You can't keep them away. Do we know why certain mosquitoes are attracted to the carbon dioxide? Um, I don't. I, I would have to look it up, but not, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. That's Good question. I like it. <laughs> probably is an indication of it's, it's gotta be, yeah. I was raised in Massachusetts. I'm 80 years old now, so I was, as a teenager, we're talking about it. 60 years ago, uh -huh. and uh, I can remember a few times where my head was really surrounded by mosquitoes. Was, did people worry about mosquito control back then as we do now? Um, we were started in 1930, well, and even well, before Cape Cod, so that's probably back there, and even before mosquito control was around, they were they were already digging those ditches on the marshes to keep the water moving, to keep the fish coming and going. So yeah, people have been worried about that for a long time. They did it in Panama. That's right. Panama is the classic. Exactly, because if you Great didn't story. if you didn't have mosquito control, <laughs> you couldn't have dug the canal in Panama. They emptied every little bit that, of. Uh, they had to do it. People were dying trying to build that canal. Yeah. Are, are you finding now that there are less mosquitoes um, around as a result of your uh, efforts on the individual <laughs> wetlands areas for draining the materials? Are you finding that they're increasing at the present time? So just for myself, I would say that Ailey would say yes. <laughs> I would say that I, I can't say that specifically. Over time, my, the mosquito populations that I sample from only change based on weather conditions. Um, I, I would say yes due to stories that I've heard of what it used to be like before mosquito control was around. Um, and I'll have to say that there are there's always a spot on the Cape. Everybody knows the coast is always changing. We always have one spot on the, on the Cape where we have salt marsh mosquitoes get emerge. So when they emerge, it's, it's a huge thing. We get 50, 60 calls. People call me and they say to me, I've lived here for 50 years. It usually starts with that. Sometimes it's 60. I'm in this house and I've never seen a mosquito and I've got so many biting me today and I think that's 50 years of us doing what we can to control those mosquitoes and who knows what changed that year. Some ditch filled in, something filled in and you had that small spot. So I can say anecdotally. <coughs> um, someone told us that he puts a fan on his porch when he sits outside and as long as the fan blows more than four miles an hour, he doesn't get bitten at all. Exactly, mosquitoes aren't great flyers. Right. That's so true, so if you could put the fan up so that it could, yeah. Yeah, so he puts a, a standing fan on his back deck, they eat outside, they don't get bitten at all, and they don't have to have chemicals, so I thought it works. No, it's good, it's good. So I would say it's good, but if he has any standing in water in his yard, he should probably dump that out. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> Can I, I just wanted to ask something very quickly, and then I'll pass it to you, Emily. Um, at dinner, we were talking about the Mosquito Shield, that there's a company where <laughs> we had the same reaction at yeah. dinner, so I thought it'd be good if you discuss this, because their ads are all over the internet around here. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk about what 
for the, if it's the mosquito shield. So I can't talk necessarily specifically about mosquito shield because I'm not sure exactly what products they're using. There are a number of these pop-up mosquito control groups that have come at companies all over the Cape, all over everywhere. <clears throat> what they sell you on is the idea that they'll come, they'll spray your yard, and you won't have a mosquito problem. So my first question would be, what are you spraying my yard with? A lot of them are spraying them with a natural product that doesn't, that doesn't, that meets the EPA's, I'll say meets the EPA's minimum risk pesticide requirements. That means that again, no EPA registration. They don't have to be tested. They can apply them and you can walk right over them. They have no proof of efficacy for any of those. Anecdotally, maybe somebody will tell you they worked great. Mosquitoes fly. So a lot of these things are based on barrier ideas. Like you spray your bushes with one of the classics for a long time, and it still is, is garlic barrier. So garlic barrier, you spray your trees with this garlic barrier, and no mosquitoes will pass through the garlic barrier. Mosquitoes fly, they don't necessarily land on any vegetation. And even a product like permethrin, if you're spraying it for ticks, that's one thing. It works great. And if you talk to Larry at the county, he'll tell you you can do that. Ticks crawl across it and come into contact with it. Mosquitoes don't come into contact with that. They fly around it. So I, I'm reluctant. I think that instead of, instead of calling somebody and paying them to come to your yard and spray it on a regular basis, why not find out where the mosquitoes are coming from and get rid of them so that they stop coming to your yard? So yes, that is my reaction. I, I, I don't know. I, I see so many of those signs now. I have two questions and then a comment of why I say that the mosquito control has, under certain circumstances, been very, very effective. So first, my questions. Um, what is your experience with permethrin-embedded clothing where Shirts, pants are sold uh, embedded with permethrin. I use them for tick repellent. I spray my boots, my pants, I spray inside, outside. I spray my shirt because on Cape Cod, I'm walking through the woods all the time. My concern is more ticks. During the day when I'm going to my trap sites, if I know there are going to be a lot of mosquitoes, I have long pants and a long sleeve shirt on anyway, so the mosquitoes aren't biting me. But I use the, I, I actually buy the spray and treat my own clothes. It, it's just meant for clothes. But yeah, it, it works fantastic for ticks. I haven't had any problems. And then the other is if you can't dump the water out, or you can't dump it out in, within three days, say, does adding detergent or soap to a container Oil. help? Oil. <laughs> So, there are, we use a mineral oil product, so I have to say that, that that would work well to put a film across because they're trying to come up to breathe and it's coating all of their breathing apparatus when it does that. But if I had a, if I had like a water garden or something where I wanted to leave water in it, I would go to the store and I would buy at the hardware store, they sell mosquito ducks. They look like a donut. They're that bacteria that I use. And I put that in the water, and then they're slow release. They last for whatever the label says, a month or whatever. I put that in there, and then the, the mosquitoes would feed on it and die. And you wouldn't have to worry about what other things are drinking your water that might be affected by what you're putting in it. Is that thuringiensis? It is. It is. It's Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. It's just a very, yeah, works fantastic. Okay, then the, <laughs> the, the story of how effective Cape Cod mosquito control has been. For many, many years, I have worked in Atlantic white cedar swamps, which are now proven to provide a haven for eastern equine encephalitis, triple E. And I did a lot of work in cedar swamps and would go in short sleeves, sleeveless blouse, and um, I would tell everybody who visited from wetlands limnologists all over the world, 
I would tell them, it's okay, you can come out with me in my canoe in this particular cedar swamp that uh, you won't get bitten because you have no biting mosquitoes here. Although I have seen the larval and pupal stages <coughs> of mosquitoes, yet they're not biting you. Well, then I saw an article when Eastern encephalitis uh, came into our area. I saw an article in the Cape Cod Times that one Gabrielle Sikorsky was saying that these mosquitoes were found in, in Atlantic white cedar swamps. I said, I published saying that it, they haven't ever been here. I, for, for 20 years I've been working in swamps. And then I found out that except for the National Public Seashore, the National Park Service, uh, that Cape Cod Mosquito Control has been treating my very study areas. <laughs> However, the only place where I was bitten was when I went through the National Park Service area and I found that you're not allowed to spray it. So yeah, that, <laughs> I say that they've been very effective. And then Gabrielle Sikorsky said that The bacteria is very specific. It's actually a variation. There are other variations of that same bacteria that are that will affect um, moths. People use it to treat for gypsy moths, and people use it to treat for some of the um, beetles that are probably Bacillus thuringiensis is relentless. It's targeted only towards mosquitoes. At the level we put it out, it doesn't affect anything else. Just a quick comment with regards to uh, standing water if you don't want to drain it. Uh, what I do for my little water garden is I just go to the pet store and I buy a little cosmos fish. A couple of dollars, you get like 20 or 30 of them. And Perfect. it takes care of everything. Perfect. But I do have a question. Uh, do you think that the decline in the bat population has affected the mosquito population? Um, I don't know about here. Uh, I'll start off by saying my mom went to graduate school and studied with people who studied bats. And as I grew up, there were bats in the refrigerator, bats in the bedroom, <laughs> in containers, obviously, bats, bats, bats. Um, the thing, and I love bats. <coughs> I love bats. Um, they do eat some mosquitoes. The thing about bats are that they're not as likely to eat mosquitoes as other things that are out there. Because it takes so much energy for a bat to fly, mosquitoes are a very small meal for all that flying around. They would much rather feed on some big juicy moth or some June bug or something. They talk about those studies where they say bats eat whatever it is, 2,000 mosquitoes a day. Those studies were done in a laboratory where the only food that was offered to the bats <laughs> was mosquitoes. So that it was a little biased, that whole bats eat 2,000. I love bats. I, I think anything you can do to encourage bat populations is important. But as far as mosquito control, they probably don't eat a lot of mosquitoes in nature, which is too bad. Anybody else?